going live now. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome you to this uh, panel uh, about trust and technology. Um, we must know uh, trust is hard to gain, and easy to lose. And also, if the lifeblood of the digital economy is data, its heart is really the digital trust. Given that trust is such a foundational principle for the global economy, and the global economy today is completely, or getting towards completely being digital, what is the meaningful definition of digital trust? Uh, we already believe tech companies have too much power and won't prioritize our welfare over their profits. The lesson is much bigger than the one about so-called fake news. The hasty reconstruction of the value chains around new technologies are introducing the, and also exacerbating ethical concerns across many industries. It's a free for all race and what's at stake is whether we are able to sustain a just and civilized society or end up in a high tech wild, wild west. Uh, there has been fallout for some of these breaches of trust for all the tech giants, which never, which felt never ending. There were some initial stock drops, the congressional testimony or grilling, as we have seen, or how the tech companies may view those grillings, rec record breaking fines from regulatory bodies, class action suits. Uh, but this is not really only about the biggest of the giants of tech. They're just one example of the evolving and murky world of self-defining ethics in technology. For emerging tech, th that means creating frameworks that incorporate accountability, auditability, transparency, ethics, and equity. We have an outstanding panel to address the issues surrounding ethics and trust in technology. I'll introduce our speakers one by one, and you can take your time to go through your introductory statement and also answer my questions. Uh, our first speaker, Pera Millen, is the CEO and co-founder of Jed Eli Technologies, CEO and founder of Venture Studio Transident Media Capital, and an author and international speaker. She sits on the International Advisory Board of the World Sustainable Development Forum. She's also a founding council member of the Digital Economist, an associate fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science, and member of two UN working groups, in transforming global energy and agriculture and global leadership in the 21st century. So Pera, the term ethical technology refer refers to an overarching set of values that is not limited to or focused on any one technology, instead addressing the organization's approach to its use of technologies as a whole and the ways in which they're deployed to drive business strategy and operations. Companies should probably proactively consider and evaluate how they can use technology in ways that are aligned with their fundamental purpose and core values. So the first question to you is, can there be a framework for ethical technology? Uh, uh, Peter, you're on mute, so you have to go. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I said I absolutely believe there can be. I think part of the challenge that we face with technology is it's so embedded in traditional ideas of economics as well. And part of the problem around that is that when we form business models or we form innovation models, they're largely extractive. How can we take or exploit certain markets or certain opportunities and extract that value out of those markets to deliver them to a number or a handful of shareholders? And, and the very nature of that mechanism depletes trust. Um, it's you're trying to take value, my inherent value or value away from me and give it to somebody else with or without my consent. So 
when we're looking at how to transform trust in technology, you also have to look at how you can transform trust in how you structure your very business models. And we're seeing a lot of pressure on large corporate organisations now with more regulatory reform coming in with governments setting their 2040, 2050 um, uh, zero, net zero emissions targets and things like this, where we're trying to look beyond just corporate interest into a broader landscape of how do we actually reduce our impact but what we're doing is we're trying to flip that on its head and say, how do we move away from conversations of how do we do less bad to how do we become inherently value-adding? And this is where we use a regenerative framework, which really clearly uses the nine principles of regenerative design and development to look at how do you design business models, how do you de design innovation strategies or even investment models that are grounded in value-adding. When you're grounding yourself in potential value or, or your inherent potential that's based on your values, then you start to build forward instead of looking into your immediate reality from a siloed perspective and say, how do I create something here and drop it into this market here and extract value here? And what happens is when you start looking at your potential, your idea of your ecosystem opens up. Your idea of stakeholders becomes broader. And in being able to access potential, you start to engage those stakeholders in dialogue and start to co-create value. As you start to become more interactive with your stakeholders, whether they be internal to your organisational state or external, basically people that are impacted, and sometimes not even people, sometimes elements of the environment that are impacted, then you start to build trust. So the trust itself doesn't come from a particular technology because technologies can be exploited for good or bad. We've seen that with blockchain, which is basically a trustless technology where it's been exploited by bad actors for nefarious purposes and it's also been used for very good purposes as well. The trust comes from the process with which you get to your innovation strategy and how you engage your stakeholders in that process. And so I think if we're looking to build appropriate technologies for trust and transparency, we have to look at the very fundamental framework from which we're making decisions. So I think if we're doing that, if we're taking that kind of approach, then we inherently start to co-create with our stakeholders, we stay, start to build trust, we start to align values, and then the technology just becomes an enabler of that innovation. Great. Thanks, Peter. Hold uh, some of those thoughts about the regenerative framework because we'll get back to you. Our next um, uh, speaker is Emidio, uh, founder and uh, CEO of Zebiometric Switzerland. Uh, which is the Airbnb of mobile sharing, no matter uh, what your brand, vendor, or operating system is. Uh, you'll be ab able to access all of your virtual world in less than 10 seconds, borrow or rent a device, log in, and you're up and running. World's first OS agnostic timelines that bundle your virtual worlds. So, Emidio, in this digital era, trust is a complex issue fraught with myriad existential threats to the enterprise. And while disruptive technologies are often viewed as vehicles for exponential growth, tech alone can't build long-term trust. So in your opinion, while you give your opening statement, how should leading organizations take a 360 degree approach to maintain the high level trust that their stakeholders expect? Thank you. Um, I think that one of the first, what, um, Peter said is, is, is so true, but there's something that we try to work on it, which is contradictory, is yes, trust, we can build trust, but what if in the same equation, we put that trust is just an illusion? Because um, trust is, is available until a human being is not in danger. Because at a certain moment, humans take decisions for themselves, not because they're going to hurt someone. Political reasons, family reasons, health reasons. So the trust that you take to, that you put on build for years and, and protocols and things in place and trust is at its utmost illusionary state just goes. Because for some reason at a certain moment, there was a need of survival or a need of 
whatever feeling that, 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 that the human had at that particular moment. And especially in companies, we see a lot of that because protocols are in place, trust is put in place, uh, and we've been working with this uh, technology and biometrics and, and all these things. And at the end of the day, there's always issues. So we need to start working on not on the technology, but on the human side. When I say we, it's what we are doing. It's more working on the human side and try to not to understand because we think we all understand how we work a little bit, but to dip inside ourselves and say that trust doesn't really, we cannot materialize trust. It's not just an object that you put somewhere and says, oh, there's trust. Um, I think that the trust, if we go in, in a sense of that accept that it doesn't exist, then we can start building a new way of trust because uh, I, I think that one of the first things that we said, I think that we need already to trust ourselves and I don't trust myself. Because my brain, my thoughts, my voices that we all have can lead me to a different perspective of things because of my family, because of whatever situation. So if we start building something on that perspective, that trust is something that we need, but that vision of the trust is probably not the best one or the, the one that can be easily adapted to other situations in the future. So that's our approach. Um, we don't believe that there will be a technology that we can trust. Uh, what we believe is that uh, by joining different aspects of technology and different aspects of the human behavior and the human thought, and probably with AI later, which when I say AI, it's augmented intelligence and not artificial. Probably we can lead this trust into a new era because until today, uh, it's like, yeah, the trust is like you can just fall down in, in, in half a second. And we've seen this situation many times in corporations. So that's uh, what we are uh, basically focusing right now. And we don't know if it's the right path. So it's wonderful to be around with incredible people today and to uh, discuss about this. Great. Thank you, Amidia. Um, trust could be an illusion, but it's more about human beings. And I can um, attest to that uh, as we are working as a startup with um, farmers or poor farmers around the world. And there is no technology that they would trust uh, other than the fact that uh, if it's really helpful for them, because there's a huge trust deficit today uh, between people who are not truly really protected. So I completely agree with what you just said. Uh, and I can get back to more of that pretty soon. But I'm going to introduce our th third speaker, Maxim Kiselev, who is a professor of practice in the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Skoltech and managing partner of MK Analytics Consulting Training, a full spectrum management and communications consulting company that he founded. He's also the CEO at the Human Capital Development Foundation under the government of Moscow. Uh, and uh, Maxim has served as Chief Business Development Officer at Technopark Skolkovo since July 2011. And he has held various executive positions, including Deputy CEO of Health Tech Corporation, Chief Corporate Communications Officer at Volgo Tanker, and also Chief of International Communication at Yukos Oil Company. So Maxim, uh, with what we've been hearing is that technology is ingrained in the business and machine learning and AI driving business decisions and actions. And the organization's values are perhaps encoded and measured within its technology solutions. Uh, but even in government systems, uh, we, where you have a significant uh, experience working with, digital systems can be designed to reduce bias and enable organizations to operate in line with their principles. So in your experience, how does it really work for a government system? Can a city government, uh, like where you have experienced Moscow, the city of Moscow, can, can it work with policy institutes to develop an algorithm toolkit intended to identify ways to minimize unintended harm to constituents by limiting biases 
for example, in the voting system, criminal justice systems, or any, any other institutions. So can you give us any examples uh, in your introductory statement? Yes, well, thank you for uh, presenting me, Avi, and it's, it's great to be uh, with all of you here. Uh, well, uh, I have been working uh, under the government of Moscow, meaning that the organization that I lead uh, is uh, actually, so to say, a daughter of the Department of Entrepreneurship and Innovational Development of the city of Moscow. So I can look at these things and try to answer your question from two perspectives. One perspective, my experience with the city government. Moscow is kind of a huge megapolis. Uh, well, the official population is close to 13 million. I mean, those who are registered, but uh, like any other megapolis in the world, of course, it's much bigger considering those people who come to work, who come to study and so forth. So, uh, and Moscow, to a certain extent, is being like country inside the country. Well, considering this, this huge size and lots of people. And uh, interestingly enough, well, when speaking about the use of technologies that might eventually contribute into trust, meaning at least people trusting what the city government is doing, right? So Moscow is somehow uh, pioneering as well as leading the whole of the country in applying technologies and in a way that at the very least would not ruin this trust. What do I mean? Well, Moscow that really help people. Well, here I do uh, totally agree with, with what Peter said and what Emilio said about trust, but uh, let me take this uh, dimension of trust like being a value or delivering a value to those who are the beneficiaries, to those like in the city, these are the, those residents of the city who can either benefit from what the government of the city is doing or not. And to that end, I may say that most of the applied technologies used by the city government, they rather go into the direction of building trust. I totally agree that we live in the time of dramatic lack of trust in general. And certainly, well, the economies of all countries of the world, they are losing a lot out of this lack of trust as well as, you know, it causes huge number of problems because the higher is the trust, the less are transactional costs and vice versa. So back to the government of Moscow and what I've said, well, uh, technologies are being used to provide more conveniences for the people who live in the city and connecting people with the institutions that you mentioned, Terry. Yeah. Making the work of the institutions as well as the work of the policymakers more transparent, because one of the dimensions, for me, one of the dimensions of building trust is transparency. When people can check for themselves whether these things have been done or not, whether it works for them, or it doesn't. And so to that end, uh, as an example, I can give you uh, probably the latest, uh, you know, uh, latest I mean over the past year, well, all countries, they were fighting the COVID situation, right? And the threat of the pandemic and so forth. And in Moscow, yeah, with the use of technologies, there was implemented this system of social monitoring, who were diagnosed with the COVID, like who had this positive test for COVID. I experienced that 
myself. So this is another viewpoint being the resident of Moscow. And I had in November, I uh, was sick with, with COVID. I had to stay home. I had it in a light format, but I had to stay at home. And this technology, this system of monitoring was making sure that I would not leave the house bringing about this threat to another people whom I potentially could actually, you know, like, like contaminate with the virus, right? I mean, as simple as that. Was it the breach of my human rights? To a certain extent, of course, it, it was inevitable because of the whole situation with COVID, right? But was that something that I could understand and could accept as the citizen as well? Uh, was it something that I would support being, you know, responsible and understanding well that I don't want anyone else uh, to get sick because of my virus, right? It was also true. So that was this kind of technology use. I'm using that as an illustration that would eventually build more of my trust into the actions of the government trying somehow to deal with the pandemic. Despite the fact that it could be an inconvenience, but quite well understood. Well, at the same time, there is the full number of things made mainly from the side of information technologies by the city government of Moscow that made life of the people much easier on the daily basis. Right now, pretty much everything can be done through the uh, portal, the big one, which is called MOS.RU. MOS standing for all of the services of the city government. By the way, back to the situation with COVID, I can say that I could call the doctors, I could get the test done, just going to my computer and and to this portal and done after that. So uh, I, I probably talking for too long, but in my experience, yes, I believe that technologies, they might be used in an appropriate way, trust building, and as a matter of fact, contributing in more trust, even to the government, which traditionally in Russia is very, very low. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maxim. There's always a balancing act for the government, uh, as you just mentioned, to uh, maintain human rights while introducing technology and what is also good for the public good, especially as we have seen in the times of pandemic and COVID. Uh, uh, thank you for your thoughts. Our last panelist, uh, Ravi Sevak, uh, who is the India country head for Safe Water Network, uh, he has 25 years of experience in the corporate sector, followed by a decade in the development sector. Ravi leads the Safe Water Network initiatives to provide safe, affordable, and sustainable drinking water access to 1.3 million people in 350 communities. With his very rich experience in water and waste operations, bulk water processing, green energy, and point of use filtration, Ravi contributes to the many different government agencies and standards committees. He was also a mentor at MIT and Santa Clara University. So Ravi, with the advent of digital technology, businesses have been asking customers to trust them in new and deeper ways, uh, from asking for personal information to tracking online behavior through digital breadcrumbs. Uh, and consumer trust in commercial enterprises, probably as we have now been discussing, is declining. And citizens are becoming wary of public institutions and workers are asking employers to explicitly explicitly state their core values. Um, but uh, in areas where you are working directly, which is also technologies that are going to be used, uh, that are being used and meant for impact-oriented services like Safe Water Network, that must have implicit and explicit trust of the public, right? So what is that you're doing that is uniquely Indian while being fundamentally universal to make it trustworthy? Thank you, Avi. Thank you for having me on the panel. 
Uh, in fact, Polnumen started Safe Water Network way back in 2006 as a non-profit with a vision of healthier and happier world through safe, affordable water for all. In India, specifically, technology, especially in the rural areas or peri-urban areas where we work, was not so pervasive. However, right since 2009 or 10, we started the operation. We put in all the technology into the safe water uh, production, delivery, and management. We found that it is very important to work with the stakeholders, work with the key opinion leaders, discuss with them the pros and cons of technology, train them, and then hand it over to them for operation. This makes it the easiest for them to start building the trust. From the very first day, 10 years ago, they were not comfortable with RFID card usage for payment because they couldn't see what money is balanced on my card. However, once they started seeing on the wall, they started seeing uh, the complete transparently the operations of the uh, plant, they started building trust. And it was extremely important during pandemic where most of the service providers actually lost 30 to 35 percent of their operations we grew by 11 percent because our technologies were in place the people were using that technology and luckily for us when we are forming the standards for the country or as advisory support unit our team resides within the ministry for building the national policy of safe water at each home, we are able to bring all these inputs into the policy framework for the country. Especially in a large country like India, which is quite backward, not necessarily everybody is digitally educated. They see their own personal benefit. Only then do they trust. And if they see that the technology is being misused against them or some of the people that they know, then their trust diminishes. Invariably, like all over the world, most of the people start with skepticism about the use of technology at a large scale by the government. However, when they start getting the benefits, like direct benefit transfers to almost 800 million people, in the country during COVID, then they see, oh, this is a good idea. Similarly, if they get correct online, uh, you know, vaccination uh, dates for each and everybody easily, then they start trusting it. Similar to that, in our case also, it started gradually building up and our use of digital technology, especially during COVID times, shot up. Uh, to almost 85 to 90 percent, which was earlier, much lower. So a lot of these macroeconomic shocks like pandemic, like demonetization, also bring about the changes in the environment, which then make people use more of technology. And then they see the benefit and start building the trust. So I think I'll stop here and uh, I can come back again if you have any other specific question. Okay. The last part of your comment may mean that we also have to use shock and awe to <laughs> make technology available to, for public good. Um, that we will get back to if it's always a good thing or not. Uh, a follow-up to you, Peta. Uh, the danger of trusting the pool of user demand uh, to shape an industry is that the user's short-term desires don't always account for the long-term societal needs. Uh, think of the power of internet uh, via social media, bringing people together. But at the same time, the choices we make on these platforms can divide us, cause hate crimes, or even make violent attacks possible as we saw in January at the Capitol or other public places. So in many situations, a user makes a choice and the society bears the burden. Of it. A lot of it is happening because of how we use uh, the social media technology platforms. So Pera, question to you is, should users demand regulation to enforce ethical practices 
and that will ensure trust and how do we balance the user's short term needs of instant gratification on the social media platforms versus the long term social societal needs of harmony balance and tolerance for each other mm. I think it's an interesting question, and I'm going to come back to uh, some comments that uh, a video made earlier. One of the things that I think is very fascinating about technology is when you're learning about technology, you're learning about systems thinking or network thinking. Yeah, when you take when you look at how the world really works, if we're expanding ourselves beyond just human beings, there's like a natural living system, like network of reciprocity that exists between all living organisms. And when you're taking a regenerative approach, similar to what Ravi was talking about, how he engaged his stakeholders in India to educate, co-create value together, there is a sense of reciprocity and mutual benefit. And when that exists, I'm going to get a little bit philosophical here, but as human beings, we have this annoying habit of always thinking that we're alone and separate. And when we're always thinking that we're alone and separate and disconnected from an ecosystem of a kind, then we flip into what Emilio was alluding to before of this survival mechanism, something that's driven by my own self-interest for my own benefit because if I don't, then something about me or my life is at risk and I need to protect my interest. But that only happens when we're separate and alone and where we're living within that illusion. If we're able to engage people from a regenerative perspective, we bring back this worldview lens of participating in a living systems network. And then our technologies can almost be a bit of a biomimicry of this type of living systems network that's based on reciprocity. So that's in the perfect world. And I believe that that can exist if we're approaching uh, the way in which we design and develop from that perspective. However, it's not a perfect world and people are still going to have this belief that they're alone and separate and that they don't belong and that they don't, you know, that they're not connected and that they will struggle to have their needs met and, and economics will keep telling us we live in a world of scarcity. So on that basis, people will be scared and people will behave in their own self-interest and sometimes behave badly and be very disconnected to their impact on others or, or things beyond them, their immediate reality. And on that basis, I believe we need regulatory, you know, frameworks in order to keep people and corporations operating within an ethical framework in which we're not working towards doing harm. And, and, I, and I think that that's fundamentally needed in order to balance out the fact that we're not yet evolved enough spiritually as creatures to understand that we exist within a living system and that we're not fundamentally alone and that we can co-create together. So I think that until we evolve, if we evolve to that place where we can live in harmony and balance, as you mentioned, Avi, then I think these regulatory frameworks are really, really needed because trust will always be broken at some level because people will flip into meeting their own self-interest as Emilio uh, alluded to before. But it doesn't mean that trust can't exist or trust can't be co-created within networks, which I think uh, the Safe Water Program demonstrates is possible. Absolutely. Uh, I agree. And that leads me um, next is also to Emilio that if there is going to be public scrutiny, and public scrutiny has been a long-standing approach to organizations or any other independent, uh, and not, you know, that much of public scrutiny happens for um, tech companies, right? Uh, so, is 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 it advisable? And you're a tech company yourself. Do you think it, it is advisable for tech companies to invite independent third-party processes, etc.? What are the pros and cons, and will it truly reflect the societal viewpoint? End of the day, which is where we want to go as well. It's a very complex question <laughs> and complex to answer because the beginning would be yes and no. Um, it's always good to, like, for example, having my way of thinking and being on this panel. So now I'm opening horizons. So it's it's very valuable to listen from people from outside, but sometimes don't. It's not because um, 
basically it's not the, 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 what's happening on this panel because on this panel people are open to to discuss to evolve and when you have some companies coming from outside they have their own vision of how things should be made and and probably they will not take the time to understand um, what are exactly your needs so i, I think that there's um there's always a risk and to answer to your question and to go back to some comments it's I think it's 100% yes, trust can be built, 100%. But I think it's there's a thin line between the word trust and the word safety. It's, it's, it's a thin line. When do I feel, when do I act in a way because I feel safe or because I trust? Or are both together or one does not go without the other? So, uh, like, for example, um, Maxim was saying that it was great to have these tools so he was feeling safe at home by being able to do things so he doesn't go outside and doesn't um, infect other people. So this feeling of safety was predominant on the, on the feeling of trust at a certain way. And of course, after he trusts the platform to, to make those things. So, uh, and, and, and I think that going back to the question, I think that when, when, when there's third parties involved, I think that the, the most important thing is how to keep this balance between feeling the safety uh, because once we feel safe well we trust because our reptilian brain disconnects um, and then we start trusting. and 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 i think we should always go back to again to um to this question of do i feel safe does the do i feel that my company or my project or my direction will lead to safety uh, or at least as much safety we can imagine so I, I think that that would be the, 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 what I would suggest is always to have this notion that we are uh, imperfect and that's the beauty of it because um, a lot of words are um, understood in, 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 in the perception that we have with, of words as the imperfection. Some people will say it's bad, but no, it's imperfection that makes us fly today. So, um, because we didn't follow the standards and the this and some things happen because we made mistakes and, and now it's saving lives. So, um, repeating once more, I think that when we get information from the outside, being social media or being with a third party company to, to advise you on something for your company, I think that uh, uh, the best way is to focus on these two words which is trust and safety and one last thing would be to think about the trust and safety of the person in front of you and not of yourself first the others and what um what ravinda is doing is just beautiful and magnificent because it's towards the others and i think if we act not being philosophical neither but when we act in a safety or the others probably that will lead into a better perception and taking better decisions uh, for um, help or advices from a third party company. No, no, no different than what you would do if you had to be a good neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> right. Correct. And, um, so, but that leads me to the uh, follow up for, um, if you could just say, uh, based on what, um, Emilio just said that, you know, as tech companies, we're not because that may or may not that may delay innovation right? uh, or, or can hamper innovation. So what is um, a good way to create policies, regulations at the same time, guide technology ethics and trust building from a regulatory perspective while not compromising innovation? If we could, if you could just take a minute or so and answer that, because I have one minute. Yeah, well, it's very difficult to answer this question in just one minute, but I believe that in general, well, first of all, I totally agree with what Peter said and what the media said before me, uh, because safety is extremely important, I would say, ground for trust. Uh, when people feel safe, they are tending to trust. So uh, then, uh, in order for the policy makers to make those decisions who would 
provide for better trust and not impair innovation. Well, uh, in the practice of the Moscow government, because I belong to this department of entrepreneurship and innovation development, uh, it is the good case where the both things can be combined. The policy is about to support entrepreneurship development and with all, all possible ways to support the cities and the ones that would actually be of help for the interpreter. So uh, being very short, well, for me, those two things, they do not contradict. And as a matter of fact, the policymakers, they have to be, first of all, thinking of value for people, for the final users, no matter what they do. And we try to create opportunities for the people using both innovation technologies and the technologies and those something like that i have no contradiction from the two things great great uh, i think we have basically ran out of time but uh, thanks everyone i think we have presented in this panel as uh, technological systems rapid restructure Ethical dilemmas will become more common and well understood theories can help us predict where problems may arise, just like the regenerative architecture that Peta has been talking about, which I find very interesting. Executive ac across industries will find it enticing, democratic access to cumbersome markets like healthcare, lending, publishing, executive, and all, all of us are who have to decouple the consumer protection, which is what Emilio has always mentioned trust for the next person, pick up your consumer protection from whatever business you're running, all the positive intentions in the world won't protect you from unavoidable backlash, right? So bottom line is predicting where, where our people will within this new world can make the difference that our business will flourish with the reputation intact, with the society perhaps a much more safer and acceptable place. I thank all my panelists for a great, wonderful session and hope to keep in touch with all of you. And you. I hope everyone has a great conference for the rest of the remainder of the conference. Thank you. Thank you, Abhi, thank for you, Abhi. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. All of you. Pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.